They lived together in a part of the country which was not so prosperous as it had once been, about three miles from one of those small towns that, instead of increasing in population, is steadily decreasing. The territory was not very thickly settled, perhaps a house every other mile or so, with large areas of corn and wheat land and fallow fields that at odd seasons had been sown to timothy and clover. Their particular house was part log and part frame, the log portion being the old original home of Henry's grandfather. The new portion, of now rain-beaten, time-worn slabs, through which the wind squeaked in the chinks at times, and which several overshadowing elms and a butternut tree made picturesque and reminiscently pathetic, but a little damp, was erected by Henry when he was twenty-one and just married. That was Fort Vate years before. The furniture inside, like the house outside, was old and mildewy and reminiscent of an earlier day. You have seen the whatnot of cherry wood, perhaps, with spiral legs and fluted top. It was there. The old-fashioned four-poster bed, with its ball-like protuberances and deep curving incisions, was there also, a sadly alienated descendant of an early Jacobean ancestor. The Bureau of Cherry was also high and wide and solidly built, but faded-looking, and with a musty odor. The rag carpet that underlay all these sturdy examples of enduring furniture was a weak, faded, lead and pink colored affair woven by Phoebe Ann's own hands, when she was fifteen years younger than she was when she died. The creaky wooden loom on which it had been done now stood like a dusty, bony skeleton, along a broken rocking chair, a worm-eaten clothes press, heaven knows how old, a lime-stained bench that had once been used to keep flowers on outside the door, and other decrepit factors of household utility, in an east room that was a lean-to against this so-called main portion. All sorts of other broken-down furniture were about this place, an antiquated clothes horse, cracked in two of its ribs, a broken mirror in an old cherry frame, which had fallen from a nail and cracked itself three days before their youngest son, Jerry, died, an extension hat rack, which once had had porcelain knobs on the ends of its pegs, and a sewing machine, long since outdone in its clumsy mechanism by rivals of a newer generation. The orchard to the east of the house was full of gnarled old apple trees, worm-eaten as to trunks and branches, and fully ornamented with green and white lichens, so that it had a sad, greenish-white, silvery effect in moonlight. The low outhouses, which had once housed chickens, a horse or two, a cow, and several pigs, were covered with patches of moss as their roof, and the sides had been free of paint for so long that they were blackish-gray as to color, and a little spongy. The picket fence in front, with its gate squeaky and askew, and the side fences of the stake and rider type were in an equally run-down condition. As a matter of fact, they had aged synchronously with the persons who lived here, old Henry Reif Sneeder and his wife Phoebe Ann. They had lived here, these two, ever since their marriage, forty-eight years before, and Henry had lived here before that from his childhood up. His father and mother, well along in years when he was a boy, had invited him to bring his wife here when he had first fallen in love and decided to marry, and he had done so. His father and mother were the companions of himself and his wife for ten years after they were married, when both died, and then Henry and Phoebe were left with their five children growing lustily apace. But all sorts of things had happened since then. Of the seven children, all told, that had been born to them, three had died, one girl had gone to Kansas, one boy had gone to Sioux Falls, never even to be heard of after, 
Another boy had gone to Washington, and the last girl lived five counties away in the same state, but was so burdened with cares of her own that she rarely gave them a thought. Time and a commonplace home life that had never been attractive had weaned them thoroughly, so that, wherever they were, they gave little thought as to how it might be with their father and mother. Old Henry Reif Sneeder and his wife Phoebe were a loving couple. You perhaps know how it is with simple natures that fasten themselves like lichens on the stones of circumstance and weather their days to a crumbling conclusion. The great world sounds widely, but it has no call for them. They have no soaring intellect. The orchard, the meadow, the cornfield, the pig pen, and the chicken lot measured the range of their human activities. When the wheat is headed it is reaped and threshed, when the corn is browned and frosted it is cut and shocked, when the timothy is in full head it is cut, and the haycock erected. After that comes winter, with the hauling of grain to market, the sawing and splitting of wood, the simple chores of fire building, meal getting, occasional repairing, and visiting. Beyond these and the changes of weather, the snows, the rains, and the fair days, there are no immediate, significant things. All the rest of life is a far-off, clamorous phantasmagoria flickering like northern lights in the night, and sounding as faintly as cowbells tinkling in the distance. Old Henry and his wife Phoebe were as fond of each other as it is possible for two old people to be who have nothing else in this life to be fond of. He was a thin old man, seventy when she died, a queer, crotchety person with coarse grey-black hair and beard, quite straggly and unkempt. He looked at you out of dull, fishy, watery eyes that had deep brown crow's feet at the sides. His clothes, like the clothes of many farmers, were aged and angular and baggy, standing out at the pockets, not fitting about the neck, protuberant and worn at elbow and knee. Phoebe End was thin and shapeless, a very umbrella of a woman, clad in shabby black, and with a black bonnet for her best wear. As time had passed, and they had only themselves to look after, their movements had come slower and slower, their activities fewer and fewer. The annual keep of pigs had been reduced from five to one grunting porker, and the single horse which Henry now retained was a sleepy animal, not overnourished and not very clean. The chickens, of which formerly there was a large flock, had almost disappeared, owing to ferrets, foxes, and the lack of proper care, which produces disease. The former healthy garden was now a straggling memory of itself, and the vines and flower beds that formerly ornamented the windows and dooryard had now become choking thickets. A will had been made which divided the small tax eaten property equally among the remaining four, so that it was really of no interest to any of them. Yet these two lived together in peace and sympathy, only that now and then old Henry would become unduly cranky, complaining almost invariably that something had been neglected or mislaid which was of no importance at all. Phoebe, where's my corn knife? You ain't never minded to let my things alone no more. Now you hush, Henry. His wife would caution him in a cracked and squeaky voice. If you don't, I'll leave ya. I'll get up and walk out of here some day, and then where would why be? Why ain't got anybody but me to look after ya, so ya you just behave yourself. Your corn knife's on the mantle where it's a lose been unless you've gone and put it summers else. Old Henry who knew his wife would never leave him in any circumstances, used to speculate at times as to what he would do if she were to die. That was the one leaving that he really feared. 
As he climbed on the chair at night to wind the old, long pendulumed, double-weighted clock, Guo went finally to the front and the back door to see that they were safely shut in, it was a comfort to know that Phoebe was there, properly ensconced on her side of the bed, and that if he stirred restlessly in the night, she would be there to ask what he wanted. It was one night, after he had looked after the front and the back door, wound the clock, blown out the light, and gone through all the self-same, notions that he had indulged in for years, that he went to bed not so much to sleep as to think. It was a moonlight night. The green lichen-covered orchard just outside and to be seen from his bed where he now lay was a silvery affair, sweetly spectral. The moon shone through the east windows, throwing the pattern of the panes on the wooden floor, and making the old furniture, to which he was accustomed, stand out dimly in the room. As usual he had been thinking of Phoebe and the years when they had been young together, and of the children who had gone, and the poor shift he was making of his present days. The house was coming to be in a very bad state indeed. The bedclothes were in disorder and not clean, for he made a wretched shift of washing. It was a terror to him. The roof leaked, causing things, some of them, to remain damp for weeks at a time, but he was getting into that brooding state where he would accept anything rather than exert himself. He preferred to pace slowly to and fro or to sit and think. By twelve o'clock of this particular night he was asleep, however, and by two had waked again. The moon by this time had shifted to a position on the western side of the house, and it now shone in through the windows of the living room and those of the while his kitchen beyond. A certain combination of furniture a chair near a table, with his coat on it, the half-open kitchen door casting a shadow, and the position of a lamp near a paper gave him an exact representation of Phoebe leaning over the table as he had often seen her do in life. It gave him a great start. Could it be she or her ghost? He had scarcely ever believed in spirits, and still, he looked at her fixedly in the feeble half-light, his old hair tingling odd at the roots, and then sat up. The figure did not move. He put his thin legs out of the bed and sat looking at her, wondering if this could really be Phoebe. They had talked of ghosts often in their lifetime, of apparitions and omens, but they had never agreed that such things could be. It had never been a part of his wife's creed that she could have a spirit that could return to walk the earth. Her afterworld was quite a different affair, a vague heaven, no less, from which the righteous did not trouble to return. Yet here she was now, bending over the table in her black skirt and grey shawl, her pale profile outlined against the moonlight. Phoebe, he called, thrilling from head to toe and putting out one bony hand, have you come back? The figure did not stir, and he arose and walked uncertainly to the door, looking at it fixedly the while. As he drew near, however, the apparition resolved itself into its primal content his old coat over the back chair, the lamp by the paper, the half-open door. Well, he said to himself, his mouth open, I thought sure I saw her and he ran his hand strangely and vaguely through his hair, the nervous tension relaxed. Vanished as it had, it gave him the idea that she might return. Another night, because of this first illusion, and because his mind was now constantly on her and he was old, he looked out of the window that was nearest his bed and commanded a hen coop and pig pen and a part of the wagon shed, and there, a faint mist exuding from the damp of the ground, he thought he saw her again. It was one of those little was of mist, 
One of those faint exhalations of the earth that rise in a cool night after a warm day, and flicker like small white cypresses of fog before they disappear. In life it had been a custom of hers to cross this lot from her kitchen door to the pig pen to throw in any scrap that was left from her cooking, and here she was again. He sat up and watched it strangely, doubtfully, because of his previous experience, but inclined, because of the nervous titillation that passed over his body, to believe that spirits really were, and that Phoebe, who would be concerned because of his lonely state, must be thinking about him, and hence returning. What other way would she have? How otherwise could she express herself? It would be within the province of her charity so to do, and like her loving interest in him. He quiver. Ed and watched it eagerly, but, a faint breath of air stirring, it wound away toward the fence and disappeared, 